Hey, I'm Luke, and today we're talking about A Crown of Swords, Book 7 of The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan. If you haven't read this book yet, definitely go read it before watching this video. I'm about to pretty thoroughly spoil anything inside this book or any of the books before this in the series, not including the prequel. So, this is anything through the eye of the world, through A Crown of Swords, is fair game in this video, and fair game for the comments below. So far, everybody's doing a great job of not spoiling any books further in the series, including the prequel, um, inside the comments, so keep it up. I'm really happy that there haven't been any trolls trying just to spoil things for people. Um, I don't know how many people are watching these videos that are reading along with me, as opposed to people that have already finished the series and are looking for a first-time reader's perspective, but in any case, it's been going great so far. If you're new to my channel, then uh, I have a bunch of other videos on here for The Wheel of Time. I've only been doing this for like five or six weeks now at this point, uh, a little under two months, I think. But uh, I am planning on finishing out The Wheel of Time series. But if you like this video and you haven't seen the others before it, you might like those. Uh, you also might not, because honestly, I've been kind of learning how to do the video recording and YouTubing stuff as we go. So uh, my first couple of videos are going to be a little embarrassing. Um, Honestly, even the future ones, I'll probably come to see this as embarrassing as well. I know there's still some things I'm doing wrong with the lighting and whatnot, but, you know, everybody's been bearing with me so far, so I'm really excited to get started and get into this book. So, as I've been going lately in these series, I think I'm going to have to have a little bit of a summary before we get into it. Um, I didn't really feel like we needed one for the first two, three, four books, but at this point, things have kind of gotten crazy, so we are going to need a summary. Um, if you don't want a summary, if that's boring, uh, I will have chapters below the video, so feel free to skip ahead past the summary if you're not interested in that. I won't be offended, it's totally fine, but I am going to try to just go through the summary as fast as I possibly can so that we can get into the real meat of what I want to talk about for this book. It's a good book. The, the whole series is good, so uh, I think you're in for a good time. With that out of the way, let's get into the summary. Oh, and before we get into the summary, actually, I just want to add a note. This does not matter for you, the, the watcher here, but I swear I am so frustrated. I recorded this entire video yesterday. I was done, everything looked good, and then I sat down to actually start editing it and I realized the entire time, I don't know if I had my lights too low or whatever. I know sometimes there's a little flash of light in the top of my glasses, but I don't think it's too distracting. But whatever I was doing yesterday, it was just nonstop reflections in my glasses. I think I was spent the whole thing looking up like this or something. and. Uh, all right, so I am redoing this entire thing. So hopefully that means I'll be a little bit quicker and my pronunciation will be better, but I just, I had to get that off my chest that this is the second time I'm recording this entire thing in uh, less than 24 hours. So that's how much I care about these videos. I hope you all appreciate it. So I'm gonna break this summary up into kind of the regions and factions that we have, starting off with Tarvalon. So Alina has continued to consolidate her power. She's constructing an immense, perhaps unrealistically immense palace for herself. She's also been punishing Aes Sedai simply to prove that she can, which is how Tesseline and Jolene wind up in Ebudar. Her thinking has become more paranoid and arrogant, seeing enemies everywhere. Though her keeper, Elvieran, truly is Black Aja, so maybe it's not all paranoia. Elvieran serves the Forsaken Masana, who always hides her face. Elvieran suspects that Masana lives in the tower, but doesn't know who that could actually be. In Chapter 32, Elida finally learns how poorly her plan to capture Rand went. In particular, she's shocked to learn that only 12 out of the 39 Aes Sedai she sent have returned. She could be deposed and stilled for this. Elvieran seizes this chance to make her move by helping Elida clean things up. Elvieran's plan seems to be to stir up conflict between the Green Aja and the Brown, Gray, and Yellow by severely punishing two Greens for fairly minor offenses while rewarding a Brown, a Gray, and a Yellow publicly. Elida, in a panic, initially acquiesces, but quickly turns her suspicion on Elvieran, commanding Sane might be saying that wrong, I'm not sure, um, Sitter of the White Aja to look for a traitor, quote, even to the Keeper herself. Sian deduces the true command here is to root out the Black Aja. Though this command is sealed to the flame, Sian goes to a friend, Pivara, in the Red Aja for help. Pivara isn't a red because she hates men, she's a red because she absolutely hates dark friends, which feels like it might be relevant here. elida has been fantasizing about adding a fourth oath to the Aes Sedai, an oath of fealty to the Amarlin Seat. Elida has a foretelling. The White Tower will be whole again, except for remnants cast out and scorned, whole and stronger than ever. Randall Thor will face the Amarlin Seat and know her anger. The Black Tower will be rent in blood and fire, and sisters will walk its grounds. This I foretell. She assumes that she is the Amarlin Seat in the prophecy, but honestly, it really seems like it's going to be a Gwen, right? Gawain doesn't show up much in this book, but we do know that he escaped Dumai's Wells, and he gathered uh, most of the surviving younglings with him. And he was also looking to save some of the Aes Sedai, which is presumably how some of them made it back to the tower. Though... We're not actually really sure what happened with him afterwards, because we really don't get a scene with him after very early in the book. Though defeated at Dumai's Wells, the Shido regroup. Savannah still leads them, and her hunger for power continues to grow. 
Some of her wise ones are clearly upset by this, but none of them have moved to stop her. Samael and Grendel have been meeting with Savannah with the names Kedar and Mysia. Though Savannah failed to capture Rand, Samael continues to tempt Savannah with gifts and the promise of a tool to control Rand if she can capture him. In addition to the strangely marked cube, he provides her with an oath rod. Someone capable of channeling the true power, likely Moradin, spies on Samael and Grendel as they're doing this. Savannah plans to keep her Gaishan forever as slaves, and she plans to have more of them than anyone else ever had. Perhaps she already does. She also plans to enslave an Aes Sedai, at least one, so that she can channel vicariously through her. In Chapter 40, Samael gives Savannah and the Shai a number of Narbaha to travel with. The Shaido plan to regroup in a better location, away from Rand's armies, but it's a trap. Samael himself creates the gateways and scatters the Shaido to be defeated. He seems to want to hide his involvement in everything going on with them. Grendel notes that Savannah took all the women who could channel with her, so although the Shaido may be mostly dissolved at this point, Savannah is still a force to be reckoned with, with many women who can channel as well as an oath rod. Savannah also has Galena declared Dot Sang and dressed in all black. Moving on to Morghese and the Children of the Light. Morghese begins the book still Pedro Nell's prisoner, hoping for his support in retaking Andor. But Pedro Nell is assassinated early during the prologue of the book in a plot by Lord Captain Eamon Valda, now Lord Captain Commander, and High Inquisitor Rodan Masanawa. Just before the assassination, Nell received a message indicating a great threat, likely the Shanshan, but he doesn't get a chance to share the warning, despite trying to hand it to the very people who murdered him. His real spy master, Balwer, isn't known to Asanawa or Valda, who see him as nothing more than a spineless secretary and plan to have him kicked out. Morghese is tortured by Asanawa, who hates her for her affiliation with the Aes Sedai, and she is also raped by Valda, who honestly just seems like a really gross thug. Amador is conquered by the Shanshan. Saranth speaks with Morghese directly, telling her that she may yet rule Andor for the Shanshan Empress while showing her the alternative, as she displays that Amathera, former Panarch of Terabon, who we remember from when Nynaeve and Elaine visit there, is now an enslaved dancer for the Shanshan. Morghese speaks the words to abdicate the throne and pass it to Elaine. Nobody else heard her say them, but she nonetheless seems to take it very seriously. After this discussion with the Shanshan, Balwer helps Morghese and her party escape. So, Morghese is now free. Moving on to Egwene's rebel Aes Sedai tower. Egwene continues to rule as Amarlin of the group from Saladar, who are now marching towards Tarvalon. She continues to struggle with the most powerful women in the hall and her keeper, Ramonda, Lelaine, and Sherian, who all mean to manipulate her as a puppet. But they are all quickly discovering that bullying really doesn't work very well on Egwene. Gareth Bryn still gathers forces and prepares to siege Tarvalon with a plan he believes will work. Egwene realizes that Bryn is essentially given loyalty of his forces to Egwene specifically, rather than to the hall or the rebel Aes Sedai as a whole. Egwene has made Theodren, Falain, Mirel, and Nisao swear oaths of fealty directly to her. Strong oaths that anyone but a dark friend would keep, and anyone subject to the three oaths literally cannot break. This absolutely shocks Swan. No Amerlin has ever done this before, even in the secret histories. Recall that even Elida is merely fantasizing about doing this, and hasn't actually done it yet. Egwene does not plan to have the Aes Sedai bow to Rand, but she does plan to create closer ties with the Aeol Wise Ones. Egwene wants to travel directly to Rand and just talk things out, but one of the only strict limits to her power is that the Amerlin seat cannot leave without permission of the Hall, which of course she's not going to receive. Lan arrives at Morel, who Moraine had his bond changed to when she died. For a warder, losing the bonded Aes Sedai is extremely damaging mentally, and Lan is not well. Morel plans to give his bond to Nynaeve eventually, but Egwene skims him near Abadar immediately, feeling that Lan needs a mission he cares about, protecting Nynaeve. Mokhedin is freed by Erangar, Halama, and skims to the Pit of Doom, where she is met by Shaitar Haran, that very strange Murdra we've been seeing around. Mokhedin is punished for her failure and for helping Shaitan's enemies. Her core self is drawn into a Korsovra, or Mind Trap, a tiny, fragile cage of gold wire and crystal. Breaking this Mind Trap would separate her core self from her body. Quote, She would still see with her eyes and hear with her ears, taste what crossed her tongue and feel what touched her, but helpless within an automaton that was utterly obedient to whoever held the Korsovra. After some time being held in a vacuole, a tiny bubble in the pattern, she is sent to Moradin, a tall, handsome, young, appearing man. He holds her Korsovra. He also has black flecks in his eyes, a sign that he has channeled the true power which comes from Shaitan many times. He acts somewhat polite, but Mokhedian is his slave, forced to wear his colors, black and red, which Mokhedian recognizes as a form of livery, even if it is very elaborate. While working for Moradin, Mokhedian spots Nynaeve and tries to kill her with balefire. Some birds distract her and she misses. That brings us to Ebodar. Matt, Elaine, Nynaeve, Brigida, Tom, Julian, and Matt's men are still in Ebodar while Elaine and Nynaeve look for the Bowl Terangriel, known as the Bowl of the Winds to the Athan Mir. Matt discovers that Jachim Caradan, the White Cloak who we know to be Bors, the Dark Friend, is serving as ambassador and inquisitor of the Hand of the Light in Ebodar. He has the woman who tried to kill Rand and Matt way back in the Eye of the World with him. She's an accomplished assassin, currently going by the name Shiani, but Caradan knows that her real name is Millie Skane. Caradan serves Pater Niel as a White Cloak, but his real master is Samael, who visits him in Abadar personally. Caradan knows that Matt is in the city, but Samael commanded him to focus on his search, presumably for the cache of Angriel, including the Bowl of the Wind. Caradan orders Millie to put her entire circle towards finding Matt anyways. Caradan is an absolute mess. 
His family's been killed for his failures, killed brutally and tortured, and he's been drinking heavily. Nynaeve and Elaine continue to treat Matt unfairly until Brigida and Avienda step in. Matt is a very productive night of drinking with Brigida, and Avienda explains that Elaine has incurred toe to Matt. Elaine wants to impress Avienda, so she works to fix the situation, dragging Nynaeve reluctantly along. Quote, to show the depth of our regret, we undertake the following promises. We will not belittle or demean you in any way, nor shout at you for any reason, nor nor attempt to give you orders. Recognizing your due concern for our safety, we will not leave the palace without telling you where we are going, and we will listen to your advice. If you if you decide that we are, are putting ourselves in needless danger, we will accept bodyguards of your choosing and keep them with us as long as possible. Now, even Elaine form a bargain with Yathan Mir. We don't know the full terms, though we do know that negotiations didn't go very well for Nynaeve and Elaine, but they will help them with the bowl of the winds. Elaine and Nynaeve struggle to be taken seriously as Aes Sedai. Even the sisters from Saladar don't treat them as full Aes Sedai, and of course the two from Elida don't either. Elaine and Nynaeve are thought to be runaways from the tower and taken to the kin, a group of women who can channel, who take in some girls and return others to the tower based on circumstances. They're surprised to learn that some of these women are very old and very powerful, yet they all see themselves as vastly inferior to the Aes Sedai. Queen Tylan repeatedly rapes Matt and continually harasses him, even in public. Everyone but Matt thinks this is hilarious, or that Matt is somehow at fault. While being attacked by Mogheddian, Nynaeve breaks her block, becoming able to channel without being angry. She's also reunited with Lan, and the two quickly marry. Elaine manages to convince the rebel Aes Sedai that her authority supersedes theirs. She meets with the Ken, who have secretly been known to the Aes Sedai for a basically since they started, and offers them the chance to join the Aes Sedai under Egwene, which overjoys them. Everyone is shocked to learn that there are 1,783 kin, nearly double the number of Aes Sedai. Moreover, Rana is 411 years old, which is so shocking that Merlel faints when she hears it. Despite feeling inferior to the Aes Sedai, they have some real power and talent. Matt finds the cash, and the kin knew about it as well. Everyone heads to the Rahad to get the Bowl of the Winds. There, they encounter Falion and Ispan of the Black Aja and their men. They battle and win, but in the fighting, a Golam kills several people, including Nelsian. Golam are immune to the One Power and seemingly blades as well, but Matt chases it off with his Fox and Medallion, saving Elaine in the process, who seems truly grateful for it. Much of the cash was carried off, but they seize some of it, including the Bowl of the Winds. Matt convinces everyone that they need to leave with the Bowl and use it somewhere else so they can avoid the Golam, the Forsaken, and the Black Aja. Nynaeve and Elaine intentionally manipulated Matt into being the one to convince everybody, which they also wanted. Everyone is preparing to leave when they realize that Oliver is missing, probably just playing outside. While searching for him, the Shanchan invade Abodar. The combination of Damani and monsters overwhelms the city quickly. A building falls on Matt, and we don't really see what happens after that. Moving on to Rand. After Dumai's Wells, Rand surveys the battlefield, counting the fallen maidens and memorizing each of their names. Everyone is worried about his sanity. Rand gives the Aes Sedai from the tower to the Wise Ones to manage, where they are being treated more or less as Wise Ones in training. The Saladar Aes Sedai are allowed freedom, but they are bound by the oath they swore to him. Throughout the book, Rand must continually fight rumors that he is now a puppet of the Aes Sedai, often by demonstrating that Aes Sedai serve him. In Rand's absence, Colvier Saigon took the throne, conspiring with Rand's kidnappers and murdering her opposition along the way. Fayil was in Kyrian at the time, and Perrin fears for her safety. Rand and his followers enter Kyrian and confront Colvier directly, in public. In a dramatic moment, Rand breaks and remakes the crown. Throughout the scene, we see Perrin focus solely on protecting Fayil, and Fayil standing at Colvier's side without explanation. Rand is outward very intimidating, but Perrin sees that Rand's sole focus in this exchange is simply not having to kill anyone, including Colivir. Rand spares her life by stripping her of any nobility and banishing her to a small farm for the rest of her life, which is frankly more shocking to everyone there than simply killing her. Rand is happy at having spared her initially, but she later hangs herself. The throne is still being held open for Elaine. A very old and powerful Aes Sedai named Ketsuan Meledren arrives to see Rand. She doesn't seem to care much about the current Aes Sedai troubles, seeing the rebels as foolish for breaking the tower and Elida as foolish for bringing that about. Mostly, she's frustrated that Elida's Aes Sedai made handling Rand far more difficult for her, and Ketsuan plans to take things over from here. She goads Rand, testing him, and strikes a nerve when she asks whether he started to hear voices yet, as she is experienced with men who can channel, and hearing voices is apparently an early sign of madness. Throughout the book, Rand is terribly anxious that Luce Theron might not be real. Rand and Min learn that Herod Fell is dead. In a moment of desperation, they have sex. Rand later sees this as something terrible that he did, so racked with guilt that he confines himself to his quarters for days. Min is eventually able to convince him that there's really no crime in two people who love each other having consensual sex. Moreover, Aeol men sometimes have multiple wives, so Rand being with Elaine, Avienda, and Min isn't necessarily wrong. Though relieved, Rand begins planning to send Min away, but she is able to convince him, at least for now, not to do so. Rand finally meets with Athan Mir and begins negotiations with him. Him being Tavirin gains some early wins, and they very quickly grant that he is the Koromor and they will do as he asks. But he has a bit of a panic attack of being confined in the ship's small quarters and has to flee before the bargain is finished. Immediately after meeting with the Athan Mir, Rand recklessly travels with men in tow to the rebels outside of Kyrian. 
There, he immediately meets both Lady Caroline Damadred and High Lord Darlin Cisnera. Caroline knows who he is, but covers for him with Darlin, naming him Thomas Trackant. Darlin intends to marry Caroline, and Min has a vision of him with a crown. Rand spends some time in the rebel camp and seems to be charming both Caroline and Darlin. The camp also has seven Aes Sedai, including Ked Swan. More importantly, Thane, going by Jarell Mordeth, is there with Torim Riaten, who also hates Rand. Rand has a duel with practice swords against Torim, who is a blade master. They seem fairly equally matched, though Torm is getting the upper hand, but they're interrupted by a sudden heavy fog which condenses into tentacles, killing and maiming everyone around. I am not sure whether this is a bubble of random evil, or this is something that Fane actually did himself. In the chaos, Rand takes a cut from Fane's dagger, right over his wound from Bilesamon. He nearly dies immediately, but is saved by Ketswan and the Aes Sedai, who rush him to Kyrian. There, he receives additional healing from an Ashaman named Flynn, who greatly impresses the Yellow Aja. The two wounds are both evil, but somehow opposed. Rand is still very weak and may yet die the wounds, but the wounds may wind up consuming each other instead. Having been incapacitated for two days, Rand's plans for Samael are hindered. Despite hardly being able to dress himself, Rand initiates the attack on Alien. He travels the Ashaman and an army directly into Alien, where the Ashaman set off flows throughout the sky to set off Samael's alarms. Bashir leads the mundane armies while Rand duels with Samael personally. Samael lures Rand into Shatter Logoth to complete their duel. There, it's night, and Mashadar is out. Rand briefly encounters Leah, the maiden that he had to abandon there previously. Rand is nearly killed and helped by a stranger with black hair and roughly his build. The stranger is a man, but Rand never feels him channel. I am assuming at this point this is probably Moradin using the true power. Rand is about to kill Samael with Balefire, but Leah is caught by Mashadar and Rand kills her to spare her that awful death. Samael is presumably caught by Mashadar as well. Rand returns to Ilion, where he is offered the crown. When asked why they offer it so readily, they explain that the grain he sent from Tyr saved many people from starvation. For the first time, Rand feels as though he might actually have earned some right to this crown, and he accepts it personally. The crown was previously known as the Laurel Crown, but becomes known as the Crown of Swords. Okay, so that was a long summary, but I don't think I could have shortened it much without cutting something important. Before we get into the deeper analysis, I've really got to say, this is the first Wheel of Time book that felt a little bit like a middle book. I don't mean that it was bad, by any stretch, but while I've praised every other book since The Eye of the World for avoiding all the pitfalls of being a middle book in a long series, I don't think I can say the same for A Crown of Swords. As I mentioned last time, the quest for the Bowl of the Winds was suspended in Lord of Chaos and resolved at the end of this book. Moreover, much of A Crown of Swords is spent resolving Rand being captured and the carnage at Dumai's Wells. The ending in Shatter Logoth also felt very rushed, almost as much so as the ending of The Eye of the World. I really get the impression that A Crown of Swords was cut into its own book by an editor, but wasn't really written that way by Robert Jordan. Now, I'm still staying away from interviews, wikis, and anything else that might spoil the books for me, so I'm not certain about this, but it just didn't feel as atomic as the rest of the series. Again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. I mean, it is a middle book in a longer series, and the plot is very complex. This isn't an episode of the week sort of production where endings and beginnings are always clearly demarcated, but it does make it tricky to come up with a theme. Nonetheless, I think we actually do have a good theme for A Crown of Swords, and that theme is balance. Just as the Laurel Crown itself has sharp swords buried among its leaves with half facing up and half facing down, A Crown of Swords is filled with both sharp juxtapositions between good and bad turns of fate and with double-edged circumstances, where bad, in context, becomes good and vice versa. I'll get into the specific examples in just a moment, but I think this theme is really crystallized by the short exchange between Min and Caroline Damadred. Here's a quote from chapter 35, Into the Woods. I could accept my young cousin on the throne, better she than some, at least, but... Those big dark eyes that had seemed so liquid suddenly became stone. But I am not sure I can, except you and Kyrian. And I do not mean only your changes to laws and customs. You change fate by your very presence. Every day since you came, people die in accidents so bizarre no one can believe them. So many husbands abandon their wives and wives their husbands that no one even comments upon it now. You will tear Kyrian apart simply by remaining here. Balance, Min broke in hastily. Rand's face was so dark he looked ready to burst. Maybe he had been right to come after all. Certainly, there was no point in letting him throw this meeting away in a tantrum. She gave no one a chance to speak. There was always a balance of good against bad. That's how the pattern works. Even he doesn't change that. As night balances day, good balances harm. Since he came, there hasn't been a single stillbirth in the city, not one child born deformed. There are more marriages some days than there used to be in a week, and for every man who chokes to death on a feather, a woman tumbles head over heels down three flights of stairs and, instead of breaking her neck, stands up without a bruise. Name the evil and you can point to the good. The turning of the wheel requires balance, and he only increases the chances of what might have happened anyway in nature. With that theme in mind, let's dig into some of the most interesting moments from A Crown of Swords. Starting off with Egwene. Ah, uh, it's really good to finally see Egwene being competent. 
It's been a long journey and Egwene still has some real character flaws, but she's finally found herself in a position where her unique strengths and flaws both serve her well. That's really key to Egwene's rise. She's not getting by purely on courage, determination, and curiosity, what I see as her strengths. Neither is she succeeding solely due to lessons learned from the wise ones and from Moraine. Even Egwene's jealousy, ego, and recklessness serve her well as Amarlin. Without these flaws, she wouldn't be nearly as effective. Consider Egwene having Aes Sedai swearing oaths of fealty to her. This is something that even Elida is still merely fantasizing about. Even Swan, who, to be clear, was deposed for debatably valid reasons, regardless of how much we like her and approve of those specific decisions, is absolutely shocked by this. It's dangerous, it sets a bad precedent, and the power could go to Egwene's head. But it might also be absolutely essential for Egwene to do what she needs to do in order to prepare to Aes Sedai for a Tarman Gaidon. Likewise, if Egwene hadn't sent Lan to Abadar, Nynaeve would probably be dead right now. And maybe Lan too. Instead, they're both alive and married. Egwene's recklessness and surety that she's right, even when everyone else says otherwise, enabled this. To be clear, Egwene didn't necessarily grow into the position. I mean, she's certainly grown since Edmund's Field, but her unique set of strengths and weaknesses hasn't really changed. There's a fair bit of just dumb luck involved in Egwene being chosen as the pupper Amarlin, but does this actually matter? At the very least, this is really no different from the Taviran luck the boys benefit from. If we consider Matt's luck to be a virtue, then I think we also need to admit that Egwene's flaws are, in the context she finds herself, virtues as well. She'd probably be a terrible Amerlin, perhaps no different from Elida, in different circumstances, but speculating on Egwene's potential failures in different circumstances seems kinda petty. If she survives to become a tyrannical Amerlin after Tarman Gaiden, that still seems like a pretty acceptable future, all considering. On the theme of balance, I should also note that Egwene's authority at the moment is only possible in as much as she's able to keep Ramonda, Lelaine, and Sherium balanced against one another. It's a very delicate balance, and I expect that we'll see more trouble of this in the next book, particularly considering that we haven't yet seen the outcome of Delana wanting Elida denounced as Black Aja and Ramonda wanting everyone essentially put to the question. Of course, we also have the Siege of Tarvalon coming up. And speaking of Tarvalon, let's talk about Elida, starting off with two quotes. From the prologue, the White Tower will be whole again, except for remnants cast out and scorned, whole and stronger than ever. Randall Thor will face the Amaryllin Sea and know her anger. The Black Tower will be rent in blood and fire, and sisters will walk its grounds. This I foretell. And then from chapter 32, Sealed to the Flame. The foretelling had been so certain, she would... Abruptly she stopped, frowning at the tiny shards of crystals clinging to the tapestry, the larger pieces scattered across the floor. The foretelling. Surely that had spoken of her triumph. Her triumph. Alvierin might have her minor victory, but the future belonged to Elida, as long as Alvierin could be gotten rid of. But it had to be done quietly, in some way so that even the Hall would want silence. A way that would not point to Elida until it was too late, should Alvierin's sales game win. And suddenly the why came to her. Alvierin would not believe it if she was told. No one would. I had to reread chapter 32 to be certain, but yeah, Elida still doesn't even consider it a remote possibility that Egwene, or any of the rebels, might be the Amarlin from her foretelling. It's only now that she's even kind of considered that it might not be her personally. I sometimes honestly just need to remind myself that Elida is not Black Aja. She's just really hungry for power and glory. Yet the whole picture here is finally starting to come together. Not entirely unlike Egwene, Elida's vices may yet serve good ends. She foretold that the White Tower would be, quote, whole and stronger than ever. Perhaps this isn't merely a euphemism for saying that the Tower will be fine, but a prophecy that the Aes Sedai will literally become stronger for this. As far as we can tell, Elida has no notion that Alvierin is actually Black Aja. Yet, as Sien deduces, Elida has begun an official investigation to root out the Black Aja, to which she adds, quote, I charge you to follow the stench of treason, no matter where it leads or how high, even to the Keeper herself. Yes, even to her. So, Elida plans to frame Alvierin as Black Aja. With Pivara involved, who absolutely hates Dark Friends, it seems like Elida may actually wind up going down in history for rooting out the Black Aja. Perhaps she'll actually gain a little piece of that glory she so desperately wants. Honestly, this reminds me of Gollum's dragon-like lust for the One Ring, and his final act is a necessary step in destroying the ring. We can't say whether this unexpected twist is part of some economy of salvation or just ironic luck. It's also hard to say at this point whether Elida will be remembered as the villain she truly is, or as the hero who rooted out the Black Aja and paved the way for a stronger tower. The Aes Sedai do love rewriting their history to serve their political agenda, so... Even if they all know what's going on, there's a good chance they're just gonna write that she was a hero. If there's one thing we do know, it's that there's just no way her palace is gonna be built to spec. It just doesn't seem structurally feasible, particularly considering she doesn't even have any Ogier Masons. Just going alphabetically, that brings us to Elaine. 
Ah, uh, Lane. I was not very kind to her last time around, was I? Well, considering that her response to Matt telling her that Tylen raped him was to suggest that he might try, quote, batting your eyelashes too, then to ignore his plea not to tell anyone, I can't necessarily say that Elaine is any more likable in A Crown of Swords. That said, she does see some major growth. First, she finally takes the first steps in actually relating to Matt better. Now, we should be honest here. This change doesn't have much to do with Matt at all to Elaine. Somewhat like the LARPers in Kyrian, Elaine is playing a bit at GA Toe. Unlike the Kyrianen, Elaine doesn't seem to be doing this for philosophical reasons, but solely to relate better to Avienda, and thus to Rand. Trying to pull apart exactly what's going on in Elaine's mind here is, frankly, a little bit cringy, but let's give it a shot. I've talked about Elaine's infatuation with Rand before. At this point, Elaine has been apart for Rand for far longer than she was with him, right? They hardly know each other at all. While Rand has had romantic feelings for practically every woman near to his age that he spent any real time with, which seems pretty realistic to me actually, Elaine is really holding out just for Rand, despite being surrounded by plenty of other impressive, attractive, charismatic, and diverse men. The only other man Elaine has actually chased at all besides Rand at this point is fucking Tom, and thank the light that seems to be over. We could consider this to be a matter of destiny in the pattern. Yes, Elaine and Elenia are practically the same word, but despite the Wheel of Time's reliance on the pattern to guide probability, I really think that we should at least try to find real causes for the effects we observe, and leave the excuse, the wheel weaves as the wheel wills, as the last resort for unexplained causality. Also, just need to call out there. Twice now, both last night and today, I got that in one try. I really, really thought when I was looking at the script that I was going to have to take like 10 takes for the wheel weaves as the wheel wills. And apparently it's not a ton twister, it just feels like one. With that in mind, Elaine's behavior when it comes to Rand and Avienda actually seems pretty relatable to me. Rand caught her eye just for being unique, and cute, and the difficulty in maintaining a relationship with him really just made it more interesting. The drama of the futility in trying to long distance date the Dragon Reborn is romantic in and of itself. What teenager doesn't love a tragic romance? Having to share him with other women is upsetting, I'm sure, but it's also filled with a bit of sexually charged taboo drama. And Elaine's just about the right age to be very easy prey for this sort of romance. For comparison, Min is a bit older and wiser, and she is definitely not enjoying the drama here. She recognizes that her infatuation with Rand is something outside of her control, and she hates that her relationship with him is filled with tragedy and compromise. Min doesn't want a tragic and dramatic romance. She's just rolling with it because she's wise and strong enough to recognize that she doesn't really have any other option. I feel, by the way, that I don't talk enough about Min. She's one of my favorite characters. I need to find more reasons just to talk about her, because she's awesome. Elaine wanting Avienda's respect feels like a natural continuation of this drama. Elaine enjoys skirting the boundaries of what's socially acceptable when she can. She loved the costumes she wore while performing in the menagerie, and she's having a lot of fun learning to curse properly. I imagine she finds a bit of a thrill in discussing something as taboo as a polygamous relationship. That this isn't as taboo to the Aiel makes it less scary. That Avienda isn't particularly happy about it either provides a link between the two women, a bit of empathy. Avienda can explain why sharing Rand is socially acceptable while also commiserating in the jealousy they're both feeling. All of this drama also helps to fill the void left by not actually being with Rand. Elaine can fill the time she might have spent simply pining for Rand and worrying that he'll cheat on her, talking with Avienda, who is in exactly the same situation. That Avienda is more worldly also sets her up as a sort of older sister or mentor. Elaine is prideful, but unlike some of her other prideful characters, she really doesn't have any problem looking for guidance and taking advice from other people. So that's the long route around to explaining that Elaine didn't really come to see that she had been seeing Matt incorrectly on her own, but when both Avienda and Brigida told her that she owed Matt a debt, she was entirely willing to take the advice. To her credit, although it wasn't really about Matt at first, Elaine truly does to have sincerely taken the advice. When Matt offers her the Fox of Medallion and then saves her from the Golam, she actually does come to see that Avienda and Brigida were right. On the theme of balance, I really like how Elaine's teenage romantic drama was sublimated into some real character growth and maturity and relating better to the people around her. But that's not the only growth we saw from Elaine this book. Now, honestly, I loved Nynaeve and Elaine finally getting some comeuppance for their arrogance when Satale and the Ken couldn't accept them as Aes Sedai. Maybe that's petty of me, and I probably should have more sympathy for them struggling to be taken seriously by the Aes Sedai, but they were just being such arrogant jerks that they really did kind of have it coming, at least a little bit. The key here, however, isn't that Elaine and Nynaeve needed to be put in their place, but that they need to actually act like adults before anyone will treat them as such. Elaine and Nynaeve can bully the men around them easily enough, simply using their title and just being aggressive, but the Aes Sedai don't cave so easily. In Chapter 30, The First Cup, we finally get to see Elaine take charge and use her queen voice to real effect. Quote, The pride of a thousand years of Andoran queens put steel into her backbone. Elaine successfully argues that rejecting her authority in Ebadar means rejecting Egwene's authority as Amarlin, which is rebellion. 
She goes on to question them about the kin and put together a daring plan to not only retrieve the bowl of the winds, but also bring an unprecedented number of women, some of them quite powerful, to the Aes Sedai. The response is even better than she had hoped. Quote from chapter 30, the first cup. Van Deen noticed her surprise and smiled. Another thing you might not know, we are a contentious lot in many ways, we Aes Sedai, each jealous of her place and prerogatives. But when someone is placed above us or stands above us, we tend to follow her fairly meekly for the most part, however we might grumble about her decisions in private. Why, so we do, Adelaus murmured happily, as if she had just discovered something. Marilil took a deep breath, absorbing herself for a moment and straightening her skirts. Vandine is right, she said. You stand above us and yourself, and I must admit, you apparently have been placed above us. If our behavior calls for penance, well, you will tell us if it does. Where are we to follow you, if I may ask? There was no sarcasm in any of that. If anything, her tone was more polite than Elaine had heard out of her before. So, to summarize, Elaine suffered a sharp blow to her pride, which inspired some real growth. Now, I don't want to push this balance theme too far. This is kind of how growth works. Something pushes at you, and you grow to push back harder at it in response. Regardless of how well my theme for today's rant fits, we definitely saw some major character growth for Elaine in this book. Her treatment of Matt after he confides in her about Thailand still bugs me, but in fairness to Elaine, everyone seems to react that way, and although that doesn't excuse it, I don't think we should hold Elaine to a higher standard than the other characters either. If anything, she's kind of the youngest one, so, you know... Everyone's kind of failing here. I'd say this leads naturally into talking about Matt, but he's also just up next alphabetically. That actually happens all throughout today. All these names are just in alphabetical order. They just randomly happen to fall into the exact order that I wanted them to be in anyways. So there's plenty to talk about for Matt in A Crown of Swords, but let's just get directly to the worst of it. Now, there's a trigger warning for this entire section, but I mean, you already read the book, right? So this shouldn't really be a surprise. Throughout the book, Tylen continually harasses Matt, culminating in raping him in Chapter 29, the Festival of Birds. This is the first instance, but it's not the last. At first, her harassment is somewhat private, but she also makes that more and more public. Now, it'd be gratuitous to quote the scene here, but suffice to say, this is very explicitly rape. She holds a knife to him with a very real threat of violence. Matt's pretty good at fighting, but a knife directly to the throat or heart would kill him just as quick as anyone else. He'd probably win in a duel, but even if he dodged the initial thrust of her knife, he couldn't likely disarm her without a fight, and she could simply call guards and say that he attacked her. To be clear, even without the knife, this would have been a rape scene. Tylen is the queen, men in Abadar don't have many rights, and even Matt's closest friends in Abadar wouldn't have likely taken his side. Note that he's only able to even kind of convince Elaine after she sees how flagrant Tylen is being. If Matt had tried to convince her earlier, before he was raped and before Tylen's harassment had become more public, then she just wouldn't have believed him. This is all really just a long way of saying that I don't think that anyone could argue that Matt wasn't raped here. Perhaps I don't need to defend this idea so much, but I would understand if someone reading quickly kind of just skimmed past the rape and assumed that it was just an aggressive relationship and that Matt can handle himself. Jordan's writing here is very good and very subtle. Right up until the actual rape scene, even I like still kind of thought that Tylen was sort of cool and that maybe she would be good for Matt. Now, the word rape isn't actually used much in Wheel of Time, and when it is, it's generally used indirectly, rather than in reference to a specific event. Bonding Rand against his will was akin to rape. Min has a vision that Helen's hands will be red with more rapes and murders. Rape is generally implied in comments like, quote, women do suffer worse than men from the attentions of Merdral, but even Merdral must find their pleasures somewhere, from Samael. Which is to say, I'm not actually sure whether men are considered legitimate targets of rape, culturally, in the cultures we've seen in the book so far. That Matt doesn't refer to his experiences as rape, using that word, doesn't really mean anything, as nobody seems to like saying that word here. What we do know is that Matt reacts as though he's been raped. Though this is an unpleasant scene and an unpleasant topic, I really want to emphasize how masterful the writing is here. Here's a quote from chapter 29, The Festival of Birds. It isn't natural, he burst out, yanking the pipe stem from between his teeth. I'm the one who's supposed to do the chasing. Her astonished eyes surely mirrored his own. Had Tylen been a tavern maid who smiled the right way, he might have tried his luck. Well, if the tavern maid lacked a son who liked poking holes in people. But he was the one who chased. He had just never thought of it that way before. He had never had the need to before. Tylen began laughing, shaking her head and wiping at her eyes with her fingers. Oh, pigeon, I do keep forgetting. You are an Abodar now. I left a little present for you in the sitting room. She patted his foot through the sheet. Eat well today. You're going to need your strength. Matt put a hand over his eyes and tried very hard not to weep. When he uncovered them, she was gone. This isn't the last time that Matt either cries or has to try very, very hard not to cry in the book, either. Here's a quote from chapter 37, a note from the palace. Moghedian and Tylen. Of the two, he would rather confront Moghedian. He touched the fox head hanging in the open neck of his shirt. 
At least he had some protection against Moghadian. Against Tylan, he had no more than he did against the daughter of the Bloody Nine Moons, whoever she was. Unless he could find some way to make Nynaeve and Elaine leave Ebodar before tonight, everybody was going to know. Suddenly, he tugged his hat lower. These flaming women really were making him act like a girl. In another minute, he was afraid he might just start crying. In addition to tears, we see that Matt responds by wanting to hide the incident, ashamed of it. He only tells Elaine in a desperate moment with no obvious alternative. Here's a quote from chapter 37, a note from the palace. Elaine poked him in the chest with hers, her skull beneath that plumed hat so cold it made his toes hurt. Mistress Corley, she said in the icy voice of a queen pronouncing judgment, explain to Nynaeve and me the significance of these red flowers in the basket, which I see you at least have shame enough to have hidden. His face went redder than Nynaeve's had thought of. A few paces away, Rihanna Corley and the other two were trying on hats and adjusting dresses the way women did every time they stood up, sat down, or moved three steps. Yet, despite giving their attention to their clothes, they had enough left over for glances in his direction, and for once they were neither disapproving nor startled. He had not known the bloody flowers meant anything. Ten sunsets would not have done for his face. So... Elaine's voice was low for his ears alone, but it dripped with disgust and contempt. She gave her cloak a twitch to keep it from touching him. It's true. I could not have believed it of you. Not even you. I'm sure Nynaeve couldn't. Any promise I made to you is abolished. I will not keep any promise to a man who could force his attentions on a woman, on any woman, but especially on a queen who has offered him. Me? Force my attentions on her? He shouted, or at least he tried to shout. Choking made it come out in a wheeze. Seizing Elaine's shoulders, he pulled her away from the carriage a little distance. Shirtless dockmen in stained green leather vests hurried by, carrying sacks on their shoulders or rolling barrels along the quay, some pushing low barrows loaded with crates, all giving the coaches a wide berth. The Queen of Altera might not have much power, but her sigil on a coach door ensured that commoners would give it room. Nelsian and Beslan were chatting as they led the red arms onto the landing. Vanim bringing up the rear and staring gloomily at the choppy river. He claimed to have a tender belly when it came to boats. The wise women from both coaches had gathered around Rihanna, watching, but they were not close enough to overhear. He whispered hoarsely just the same. You listen to me. That woman won't take no for an answer. I said no, and she laughs at me. She starved me, bullied me, chased me down like a stag. She has more hands than any six women I ever met. She threatened to have the serving woman undress me if I didn't let her. Abruptly, what he was saying hit him, and who he was saying it to. He managed to close his mouth before he swallowed a fly. He became very interested in one of the dark metal ravens and laid on the haft of Zashandre, so he would not have to meet her eyes. What I mean to say is, you don't understand, he muttered. You have it all backwards. He risked a glance at her under the edge of his hat brim. A faint blush crept into her cheeks, but her face became solemn as a marble bust. It appears that I may have misunderstood, she said soberly. That is very bad of Tylen. He thought her lips twitched. Have you considered... Practicing different smiles in a mirror, Matt. Startled, he blinked. What? I have heard, reliably, that that is what young women do who attract the eyes of kings. Something cracked the sobriety of her voice, and this time her lips definitely twitched. You might try batting your eyelashes, too. Catching her lower lip with her teeth, she turned away, shoulders shaking, dust cloak streaming behind as she hurried towards the landing. Before she darted beyond hearing, he heard her chortle something about a taste of his own medicine. Rihanna and the wise women scurried in her wake, a flock of hens following a chick instead of the other ways around. The few bare-chested boatmen up out of their boats stopped coiling lines or whatever they were doing and bowed their heads respectfully as the procession went by. Snatching off his hat, Matt considered throwing it down and jumping on it. Women! He should have known better to expect sympathy. He would like to throttle the bloody daughter heir, and Nynaeve too, on general principle. Except, of course, that he could not. He had made promises, and those dice were still using his skull for a dice cup. And one of the forsaken might be around somewhere. Settling the hat squarely back on his head, he marched down the landing, brushed past the wise women, and caught up to Elaine. She was still trying to fight down giggles, but every time she cut her eyes his way, the color in her cheeks renewed itself, and so did the giggles. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, but it's only after Matt offers his foxhead medallion that Elaine responds with, I'm sorry that I laughed at you. She cleared her throat, looking away. Sometimes I forget my duty to my subjects. You are a worthy subject, Matram Cawthon. I will see that Nynaeve understands the right of... of you and Tylen. Perhaps we can help. No, he spluttered. I mean, yes, I mean, that is... Oh, kiss a flaming goat if I know what I mean. I almost wish you didn't know the truth. Nynaeve and Elaine sitting down to discuss him with Tylen over tea? Could he ever live that down? Could he ever again look at any of them in the eye afterward? But if they did not, he was between the wolf and the bear with nowhere to run. Oh, sheep swallop, sheep swallop and bloody buttered onions. He nearly wished she would call him down for his language, the late Nynaeve would, just to change the subject. The line that stands out here most to me is, he should have known better than to expect sympathy. 
We see here that, although he desperately wants to hide the whole affair, he also wants sympathy, and maybe even help. Though not if that help means telling other people, which is, of course, precisely what Elaine does. In addition to shame and fear, we also see Matt acting scandalized by the Festival of Birds. Now, Matt is from the Two Rivers, and I wouldn't have been surprised at a comment or two about how crazy Ebodar is, but you'd normally expect that to be a pleasant shock. Instead, he's merely appalled. Matt's parting words to Tylen are also worth noting. I'll miss you too, he muttered. To his shock, that was the simple truth. He was leaving Ebodar just in time. But if we meet again, I'll do the chasing. Now, I've been mostly focusing on Matt's response thus far, but note how everyone else responds. Elaine and Avienda think it's funny. Tylen's staff think it's funny. Tom and Julian think it's funny. We don't really learn what Nynaeve thinks about it, as she's preoccupied with Lamb. I'm actually not really sure what Nynaeve would think if she wasn't so distracted. I could see her doing almost anything here. I could see her accusing Matt of bringing it on itself. I could see her thinking he made the whole thing up. Or I could see her actually wanting to protect him. For all Nynaeve's fault, she joined the whole adventure in the first place to protect the kids from Emmons Field. If she thought Tylen was hurting Matt, I don't think she'd hesitate to do something about it. But I'd also be kind of surprised if she didn't at least partially blame Matt for bringing it on himself. I also want to point out Elaine's comment that Matt was getting a taste of his own medicine. Matt himself considers this for a moment during the Festival of Birds, when he thinks he had never chased any woman who let him know she did not want to be chased. From what we've seen of Matt, I think he's actually being completely honest with himself here. Matt certainly enjoys playing with women, but as he says to himself after killing Melindra a few books ago, women were glad when he came into their lives. It was not boasting. Women smiled for him, even when he left them. They smiled as if they would welcome him back. That was all he ever really wanted from women. A smile, a dance, a kiss, and to be remembered fondly. I really don't think that Matt has any problems with seeing women as people and respecting them. We actually get another glimpse of this with Matt's relationship with Brigida. From chapter 28, Bread and Cheese. Normally to him, women were to admire and smile at, to dance with and kiss if they would allow, to snuggle if he was lucky. Deciding which woman to chase was almost as much fun as chasing them, if not nearly so much fun as catching them. Some women were just friends, of course, a few. Egwene, for one, though he was not sure that friendship would survive her becoming Amarlin. Nynaeve was sort of a friend, in a way, if she could forget for one hour that she had switched his bottom more than once to remember that he was not a boy anymore. But a woman friend was different from a man. You always knew her mind ran along different paths than yours, that she saw the world with different eyes. Brigida leaned towards him on the bench. Best be wary, she murmured. That widow is looking for a new husband. The sheath on her marriage knife is blue. Besides, the house is over there. He blinked, losing sight of the sweetly plump woman who rolled her hips so extravagantly as she walked, and Brigida answered his sheepish grin with a laugh. Nynaeve would have flayed him with her tongue for looking, and even Egwene would have been coolly disapproving. By the end of the second day on that bench, he realized he had sat all that time with his hip pressed against Brigida's and never once thought of trying to kiss her. He was sure she did not want to be kissed by him. Frankly, considering the dog-ugly men she seemed to enjoy looking at, he might have been insulted if she had. And she was a hero out of legend, whom he still half expected to leap over a house and grab a couple of Forsaken by the neck on the way. But that was not it. He would as soon have thought of kissing Nelsian. The same as the Tyrim, just exactly the same as, he liked Brigida. So, Matt definitely tends to see women as sexual conquests and his female friends as different from his male friends, but with Brigida, he has just a friend who happens to be female rather than a female friend. I think we should avoid the easy conclusion here, that Matt being raped is somehow good for him and will teach him to see women as people. Matt already saw women as people. That quote I just read from above was before the rape scene. I think that was an intentional point from Jordan. Matt always respected women's consent, and he was already learning to relate to women better as just people rather than as something foreign, without having been raped. There's really no upside to Tylen's crime here. It was just bad, and it would have been better if it hadn't happened. Alright, so I spent a lot of time talking about Tylen there, but let's get back to the rest of Matt's journey in A Crown of Swords, as it wasn't all bad. For the first half of the book, it was actually pretty great. Matt had a very productive evening drinking with Brigida on Swoven Night. As we discussed earlier when talking about Elaine, Brigida and Avienda finally force Elaine and Nynaeve to stop being such jerks to Matt. Granted, it doesn't fully hold, they're still using him at the end of the book when they manipulate him into convincing the Athan Mir to leave Eladar. Nonetheless, there's at least some improvement here. At the very least, they acknowledge that Matt infiltrating the stone and risking the Forsaken and the Black Aja to save them was actually pretty goddamn laudable. The whole situation with Tylen is pretty terrible, but at least his relationship with Nynaeve and Elaine is improved. We also see that Matt himself is showing some character growth, finally seeing that his being Taviran might make him responsible for other people. Here's a quote from chapter 39, Promises to Keep. Some of them followed Matt Cawthon because they thought he was lucky, because his luck might keep them alive when the swords were out, and some for reasons he was not really sure of, but they followed. Not even Tom had ever more than protested an order of his. Maybe Renal had been more than luck. Maybe his being Taviran did more than dump him in the middle of trouble. Suddenly he felt responsible for these men. It was an uncomfortable feeling. 
Matt Cawthon and responsibility did not go together. It was unnatural. So overall, Matt had a really rocky time this book. He had some great moments and some spectacularly low ones, and he's also showing some good character growth. Unfortunately for Matt, I suspect he's going to spend some time with the Shan Shan in the next book, given that he had a building dropped on his head during the invasion of Ebodar. Maybe we're finally going to get to see him meet the daughter of the Nine Moons, and hopefully, light willing, it'll go better than it did with Tylen. All right, so I swear that I put these names in alphabetical order. I'm not transitioning to Morghese because she was also raped, but Morghese also had a pretty rocky book. She ends it in a much better place than Matt. She's back on the road, away from both the Children of the Light and the Shan Shan. That's definitely an improvement. But she was raped by Iman Valda and tortured by Radha Masanawa. She's also abdicated the throne, passing it to Elaine. Nobody else heard her speak the words to pass the throne to Elaine, but it seems that she takes them very seriously regardless. I need to pause for just a moment and call out just how goddamn tough Mergace is. She spent a long time being raped and otherwise violated by Ravin, fled her kingdom, was a prisoner of Pedro Nial, and has now been tortured and violated by both Asanawa and Valda. She hasn't seen her children in quite some time and really can't know whether they're okay. Despite all of this, we hardly hear her complain at all. She's focused entirely on getting Andor back and ensuring that Elaine inherits the throne. That's hella tough. She also encountered Suroth in the Shan Chan. We see, through Morghese, that Amathera, Panarch of Terabon, is now an enslaved dancer. The Shan Chan are making some astounding early gains, quickly setting themselves up as the most significant threat other than Shaitan. Fortunately, Morghese has seen how powerful they are, and she's free now. It would have been great if Morghese could have escaped before suffering at the hands of Valdo Asanawa, but if she had, then she wouldn't have seen the strength of the Shan Chan, and she might not have spoken the words that meant that she will not likely make an attempt at retaking Andor for herself. This is a really big deal. Mergace trying to retake the throne from Rand could have been an absolute disaster for everyone involved. Elaine being handed the throne from Rand could also be a disaster, as she would appear to be his puppet. With Mergace involved and no longer aiming for the throne herself, she could help to make Elaine's ascension legitimate without war with Rand. Mergace's time with the Children of the Light and the Shan Chan were truly a double-edged sword. Side note, I really like the little bits of the old ton that we're seeing. We learn from Moghedian that Miyakova means my owner, and we learn from Suroth that Dakovele means person who is owned. It seems to me that Kova refers to ownership, with Kova being transitive, as in person who owns, and Kovele being intransitive, as in person who is owned. Again, I'm trying to stay away from any material outside of the books, but once I'm done with the series, that's the first thing I want to do is start looking up. I'm sure someone has written like a whole guide to the old ton, and uh, like maybe even Jordan himself. I, I really I haven't looked, but I'm really excited to look into that. I love that language stuff. Like that was probably my favorite part of Skyrim, is learning as much of the dragon ton as I possibly could. <laughs> So, speaking of people who are owned, let's talk about Moghedian. If Morghese's experiences in A Crown of Swords are a double-edged sword, then Moghedian's journey feels more like being flipped out of the frying pan and into the fire. She's finally free of the Idam, but now she's subject to a mind trap, which seems far, far worse. Nonetheless, she's once again serving Shaitan, which she wants to do, and though her new owner, Morden, isn't likely as merciful as Egwene, he's also probably less likely to simply kill her than the Aes Sedai if they had discovered her. It's hard to say whether this development will ultimately be good or bad for Moghedian. Moghedian also comes up in the Nynaeve section for today, but first let's briefly touch on Moradin. Starting off with the question, who is Moradin? In Chapter 25, Mind Trap, we meet him as a dark friend who holds Moghedian's Corsovra. Actually, he holds multiple Mind Traps. Physically, he's described as tall, broad-shouldered, and young, of a size with Rand. He has remarkably blue eyes, and in Moghedian's eyes, his only aesthetic flaws and overly strong chin. He also has black flecks in his eyes, which Morghedian calls Sa, which indicate that he has channeled the true power, which comes from Shaitan, many times. Given this description, it sure seems that this is the same person who was spying on Samael and Grendel, if only because that person also used the true power. It also seems like he's probably the stranger who helped Rand and shatter Logoth. Rand notes that he doesn't sense this man channel. Perhaps we have a similar situation with Arangar, but I really doubt it. The stranger is also described as being big and around the same age as Rand. Now, Rand doesn't note the remarkably blue eyes, but he does note black hair and a black coat. Well, we know from Moghedian that Morden's colors are black and red, so the black coat fits, though it's not the most uncommon color for a coat. We can't be certain this is the same person, but it does fit nicely. Rand also notes that he does not recognize the man's face, so he cannot be a Forsaken. But Rand doesn't know that the Forsaken can be reborn by Shaitan's power, providing that they aren't killed by Balefire. Hmm. Have we seen any other characters using the true power? Well, once again, we should look at the prologue to the Eye of the World. There, we see a black-clad man using a different power that comes from Shaitan. A Forsaken who, as we learn in Chapter 26 of The Shadow Rising, was only partly trapped, or maybe not at all. 
Ellen Morin, also known as Ishmael and Bilesmom. All right, so I don't have any real proof here, but Bilesmom wasn't killed by Balefire. And if we're pretty sure that Agonar and Balthamal were chosen by Shaitan to be reincarnated, I don't see why he'd skip Ishmael. Think back to the Eye of the World. There, Rand saw Bilesmom fueled by a great black core that ate light. That sure sounds like the true power. Note that Rand wasn't experienced enough in the One Power at that point to really note whether he could feel Bowsman channeling or not. Also note that Bowsman didn't want to kill Rand. When Rand forms a Sword of Light, Bowsman's response is to say, Fool, you will destroy yourself. You cannot wield it so. Not yet. Not until I teach you. This fits with the Stranger in Shadow Logoth saving Rand and warning him that a great many plans will have to be relayed if you let yourself be killed now. The Stranger also knows Samael well enough to give Rand the tip that Samael always liked destroying a man in sight of one of that man's triumphs, if he could. Lacking that, somewhere the man had marked as his would do. Despite not looking like any of the Forsaken, this sure sounds like something that only one of the Forsaken, or at least someone who knew them, would know. So I really think that Moradin is Ellen Morin, Ishmael and Bilesman, either reincarnated by Shaitan or perhaps something even stranger. And I really should just leave things here. Ishmael being reincarnated by Shaitan as Moradin is a perfectly fine theory, but Indulge me for just a minute here while I completely overthink this. So there's a running theme that many of our male characters are somehow split into multiple parts. For Perrin, this is mostly philosophical. He sees himself as both a blacksmith and as a warrior, and then I guess he also has his human and his wolf selves. For Rand, it's literal. He has loose Theron in his mind. Matt has the memories of dead men jumbled up in his own memories. We haven't come back to it in a while, but we also have whatever's going on with Lord Luke and Slayer. I'm really curious what Ishmael being only partly trapped or maybe not at all means. Now, perhaps this just means that Balsamon was geographically trapped near the Pit of Doom, only able to command minions. That's kind of backed up a little bit with the scene um, with boars in um, The Great Hunt. Or maybe only part of him was trapped, while the rest roamed free. Again, I'm probably overthinking things here, but maybe Morden and Balsamon aren't the same person, but are each parts of Ellen Morin. Regardless, with Morden we have a character who still serves Shaitan, who we know to be inherently evil. Yet, in A Crown of Swords, Morden really isn't a problem for our heroes. He's keeping Moghadian leashed, and he saved Rand. That Bill's gonna come due eventually. He might even become the most significant threat. I mean, especially use Baalzman, our first big bad, maybe the big bad again for the end of the book. But for now, he's ambiguous. Another double-edged sword. All right, let's talk about Nynaeve. Nynaeve had a pretty damn good book. She broke her block and got married to Lan. Perfectly on theme for today, both of these joyous developments only came about as the result of tragedies. Breaking her block only came as a result of surrendering to pure helplessness, drowning beneath an overturned ship after Moghadian's reckless bit of balefire. Do note that, while we don't really care about them, this bit of character growth came at the cost of a couple of Matt's men being burned with balefire. Still, for Nynaeve, this is fantastic. Quote from chapter 31, Mashiara. She hammered a fist against the seat until she felt it bruise, fighting for the anger that would allow her to channel. She would not die, not here, alone. No one would know where she had died. No grave, just a corpse rotting at the bottom of a river. Her arm fell with a splash. She labored for breath. Flecks of black and silver danced in her eyes. She seemed to be looking down a tube. No anger, she realized dimly. She kept trying to reach for Sidar, but without any belief that she would touch it now. She was going to die here after all. No hope, no lamb. And with hope gone, flickering on the edge of consciousness like a guttering candle flame, she did something she had never done before in her life. She surrendered completely. Sidar flowed into her, filled her. It's hard to tell whether she learned any philosophical lesson here, that perhaps she doesn't need control over everything and everyone around her at all times, but she's at least learned how to channel without being angry. Alone, this is a really major development. Bear in mind that Nynaeve is immensely powerful, perhaps the most powerful woman alive, but needing to be angry to channel was a major problem. It wasn't as simple as simply needing to think angry thoughts. This must have also prevented her from focus and study. This development doesn't merely mean that she can channel more often, like in fights. It also means that she can start practicing. She can practice with a clear head and she can channel with real focus on what she's doing rather than having to maintain that anger. She also gets married to Lan, which is only possible because Moraine died and passed Lan's bond to Morel. Again, these are bad things. I've already talked about passing on the bond at length, so I won't repeat all that here, but it was pretty bad. Yet without those two events, Lan and Nynaeve wouldn't be married. They might not even be alive. All right, I saved Rand for last. I mean, again, it's alphabetical, but I would have done him the last regardless. So let's get into it. Rand is being pushed nearly to his breaking point. Right at the start, in chapter two, we have this line from Perrin. 
There had been nothing for it but to settle on his heels and listen to Rand recite all 151 names in a voice like pain stretched to breaking. Listen and hope Rand was holding on to sanity. From there, things really don't get much better. Rand does everything he can to spare Colvier's life, but in the end, she still commits suicide. He learns that Herod Fell has been brutally murdered. The only bit of comfort he finds in all this is sex with men, which he then twists and interprets as a crime that he's committed against her, hitting what's probably his lowest point so far when he cloisters himself away, hardly eating and not bathing at all for days. He sends all his friends away except for men, and now he even feels as though she's lost him, and by his own monstrous actions. Yet, it's at this point that Rand finally finds some relief. Seriously, I don't often feel like I have a reason to talk about men just because I don't see what character growth she needs, given that she's been the best right from the start. Whereas Avienda and Elaine have practically conspired from the beginning to drive Rand insane, Min is able to defuse Rand's spiral with a bit of reason and empathy. Well, and kicking, but still. Even when you stand me on my head, you make all my troubles shrink. Side note, we get yet another iteration of the running gag that the boys all think that they know the least about women compared to their friends. Quote, Rand took a deep breath, parented such a serene marriage with a smiling, gentle wife. Why was it that he always seemed drawn to women who spun his head like a top? If only he knew the tenth part of what Matt did about women, he would have known what to say at all this. But as it was, all he could do was blunder on. So, out of a low moment, Rand finally seems as though he might come to accept that being the Dragon Reborn doesn't mean that he can't have any relationships. This is really important, as isolation is only exacerbating the pressure he's already under. Which segues nicely into the topic of Rand's madness. So, is Rand going mad yet? I've previously asked what this even means, and I think we're still stuck at mostly the same place we've been at for a couple of books now. Other than hearing Luce Theron's voice in his head, I really don't think that any of Rand's behavior can't be perfectly explained by the immense pressure he's under and the great power he now wields. After being trapped in a box and tortured in Lord of Chaos, Rand is definitely traumatized, but who wouldn't be if put through the same ordeal? His fear of the dark and confined spaces is clearly the result of that experience. We see this manifest in a panic when he's dealing with the Athan Mir. By the way, I really liked that scene. The description of the interior of the white spray was just perfect. I'm hardly an expert on boats, but I used to do a fair bit of sailing with my parents when I was a kid, and we had a houseboat for a while. I wasn't anywhere near as big then as I am now, but I'll never forget how cramped it was. I wouldn't consider myself to be claustrophobic, but I've definitely had a couple of moments of near panic while confined on boats or on airplanes. One time as a kid, I visited a museum with a submarine. I was really young, so I don't really remember like any of it, but I'll never forget just the sudden moment when I needed to be out. And I've never been confined in a box like Rand has. His response on the white spray to break the chair he was sitting in and then run out felt very relatable and real to me. There's no supernatural madness here that I can see. We're also continuing to see his temper worsen, but again, this seems perfectly reasonable given the pressure he's under. The fight with Perrin was staged, but Perrin chose a topic that actually does frustrate Rand, worrying over the well-being of the Aes Sedai who tortured Rand and Min. Frankly, I don't really blame Rand for getting mad enough here to actually hurt Perrin a little. Keeping them alive as prisoners is a good political move, demonstrating that he's not a puppet of the Aes Sedai, but if it were me, I would have stilled the lot of them from the tower. What we are finally seeing is Rand act a little bit arrogant. Now, Egwene's been accusing him of arrogance like since the very beginning, and I really hadn't seen it much until now, but at this point, he does seem to be getting a little bit full of himself. We could say this is loose there and rubbing off on him, but again, I think this is also explained merely by the circumstances Rand finds himself in. His negotiation with the Athan Mir worked, after all. The real problem with this ego is that he just continues to be suicidally reckless. Consider that the whole reason that nobody noticed he was captured last book is that he frequently travels without telling anyone. So why the hell is he still doing this? When Rand travels to the rebel camp near Kyrium, Min, being smart, thinks it's too reckless, but Rand doesn't see any problem with it at all. When Min points out that Nandera won't like it, Rand has the gall to say, oh, she won't know, ma'am. I do this all the time and they never know. He even had a twinkle in his eye. So some of this is just Rand's ego, a result of the power he wields, and him just being fairly young. But in this particular scene, I do think there's a little bit more to it than that. Quote, I need to keep moving while I'm sure it's still working. On the surface, Rand believes that he's noticed that his Deviren powers are working today and he needs to take advantage of them. Beneath that, I think we're seeing Rand freaking out and not being able to sit still. Note that this scene occurs shortly after his panic attack on the white spray, which wasn't long after Min finally broke him out of his spiral. I think that Rand is too jittery to stay still and perhaps a bit afraid to be left alone with his thoughts. Then there's Ked Swan's comment, that hearing voices is a symptom of madness. I've touched on this before, but I'm really not sure what to make of Rand hearing Luz Theron. 
Is this unique to him, a part of being Dragon Reborn? The information he receives from Luz Theron appears to be accurate, so I think we can rule out the possibility that he's simply hallucinating. But perhaps this is a symptom of madness. Now, do all men who go mad from the taint on Sidon hear the voices of their previous selves? Or perhaps they all hear Luz Theron specifically, or one of his companions who sealed the boar. Maybe all of the men present when Sidon was tainted are trapped in it, haunting the men who feel that taint thousands of years later. We can't really say for certain, but I think that Moraine probably would have said something if this was the case. It seems like this would be really hard to keep secret if every man who goes mad hears Luz Theron or one of his companions in particular. I suppose it's possible that just nobody has noticed or that the Red Aja and Kazwan have been keeping that information secret, but even for the Aes Sedai, that seems like a really hard thing to keep secret. For now, I think we'll just need to wait and see. I actually really want to talk more about Ketswan at some point, but I'm pretty sure this is going to be my longest video yet, at least certainly of the ones where I have a script, and I'd really like to wrap it up soon so this doesn't run on too long. There will also probably be more to say about Ketswan in the next book, I'm guessing. But back to the theme of balance. We can really see that Rand's experience in A Crown of Swords oscillated wildly between highs and lows. Low at Dumai's Wells, high when saving Colavir. Low when Colavir killed herself and Herdfell was murdered, high when he has sex with men. Low when he thinks having sex with men was a crime, high when she convinces him that it wasn't. Low when he needs to flee the white spray, high when the negotiations with the Athan Mir start off strong when he makes a good first impression on Caroline and Darlin. Low when he's nearly killed by Fane, high when he survives and manages to catch Ilian by surprise. Low when he kills Leah and Stadar Logoth, high when he defeats Samael and his crown king of Ilian. Note that we actually get to see Rand's humanitarian efforts from way back when he was in Tyr paying off. Sending grain to Ilium was a bad political move for him at the time, something that he only did because he's a good person. Here's a quote from chapter 41, A Crown of Swords. You still haven't said why, because I conquered you? He had conquered Tyr and Kyrian too, but some turned on him in both lands still, yet it seemed to be the only way. That do be part, Gregorin said dryly. Even so, we might have chosen one of our own. Kings have come from the council before, but the grain you did order sent from Tyr is your name on every lip with the light. Without that, many would be dead of starvation. Brand did see every stick of bread go to the army. Rand blinked and snatched one hand from the crown to suck on a pricked finger. Almost buried among the laurel leaves of the crown were the sharp points of swords. How long ago had he commanded the tyrants to sell grain to the ancient enemy, sell it or die for refusing? He had not realized they kept on after he began preparations to invade Ilium. Maybe they feared to bring it up, but they had feared to stop, too. Maybe he had earned some right to this crown. That bit with Leah was also really significant. Rand started the invasion of Ilion off with the hope, quote, Today, the light willing, no women would die because of him. The invasion is an overwhelming success, but he personally kills Leah with Balefire. That he was using Balefire really struck me here. Doesn't that mean that she's been burned from the pattern? Perhaps this is still preferable to being consumed by Mashadar, but it's absolutely horrifying regardless. I'm also a little skeptical that Samael is actually dead. I mean, I said the same thing about Lanfear, and it seems like that stuck, and... It did seem like Mashadar enveloped the entire structure that Samal was in, but I, I'm very trained by media that if you don't see the killing blow and the body, then it didn't actually happen. So, But it's not just the events of A Crown of Swords that show that alternating pattern of upward and downward facing swords. The main point that got me thinking of the theme of this book, in addition to the crown itself, is the balance of the fresh wound Rand received from fame with the old one he got from Balzaman. When Flynn heals him, we get this quote from chapter 36, Blades. I couldn't really touch what's wrong. I sort of sealed them away from him, for a time anyhow. It won't last. They're fighting each other now. Maybe they'll kill each other off while he heals himself the rest of the way. Sighing, he shook his head. On the other hand, I can't say that they won't kill him, but I think he has a better chance than he did. Rand now has the evil of Shaitan and the evil of Shatter Logoth festering against each other and against him on his side. That wound from Balzaman has been causing Rand real problems since he received it. It frequently reopens, and the pain of it is so severe that Alana can hardly bear it through their bond. We've seen the effect of the dagger before, too. I'm really curious how Alana is holding up now that Rand is marked by two flavors of evil. I'm also curious to see how the conflict between the various forms of evil will play out. We've already seen Fane warped into something that even Madral fear as much as men fear Madral, so... <sighs> Alright. That was long. That was long even before doing it twice. Uh, I don't know, I, I feel like I'm talking really quick today, so maybe this video won't be my longest one, but... This definitely feels like my longest video. It's definitely the longest script I've had by a wide margin. So we'll see how long it is after I actually finish editing it. Um, but I'm going to wrap it up here. I did have a couple other minor things I wanted to get into, like the symbolism of marriage knives and the laurel crown becoming the crown of swords. Um, I also, honestly, I, I'm going to be surprised if I didn't even once say crown of thorns instead. If I did, I'm just going to leave it in. 
nothing I can really do about that. Um, but I'm really excited to get going on to the next book, so I'm gonna try to get this edited in the next day or two, get it online. And uh, this is the first video I made where it's not kind of a back video where I'm just taking an old script. This is the first one where I actually, you know, read the book and then wrote the script and then recorded it and then edited it since the last video. So however long it's been since the last video came out, that's around how long it's probably gonna be going forward. I think it's been around three weeks. I'm gonna see if I can get it down to two, but expect two to three weeks for videos going forwards, um, assuming nothing else comes up, in which case it might be even a little bit longer. Doing my best there, but I don't wanna rush this and do a bad job. I also wanna call out, by the way, that I've been getting plenty of comments and likes and subscriptions so far. Um, I mean, not as much as some other channels, I'm sure, but it's it seems like a lot to me, and I really value all of it, um, especially how polite and supportive and really how much engagement I've gotten in the comments. It hasn't just been the occasional like or someone just saying I agree or something. I've gotten some really good, interesting comments, some of which have actually made me rethink some points that I had or think deeper into things. I've, I've even gotten some corrections, and even when people have corrected me, they've all been very, very polite. I've yet to have a single troll that is trying to spoil things or being unnecessarily mean or anything like that. I've, I really, really value it a lot. It means a lot to me. I'm gonna finish the series regardless. I mean, I'm already halfway done. Why not finish it? But having this kind of support and this engagement and feedback makes it so much more fun for me. I'm not merely just finishing it up because, well, I already did half of it. I'm finishing up because I wanna see what people say about it and I'm hoping that people will continue to like it. So please, if you like this, continue to leave comments. If you're new, I, I, I love the comments. I read every single comment. I try to come up with some response to them. If I haven't responded to your comment, it's not because I don't like you or something. It's just because I honestly couldn't think of what to go from there. A lot of times I'll just kind of like it to indicate like, yeah, plus one to that, but I don't really have anything extra to say to it. So, um, you know, I am reading all the comments. Um, I really like all the feedback. Thank you so much. It means so much to me. So, um, you know, please keep doing that. And again, any other feedback on um, the actual process of the video and such, that's the one thing I don't think anyone's talked about, um, which maybe I'm just completely nailing it. But if anyone has any feedback on things I could do, like, is it weird the way I'm doing hand gestures like this? You know, I don't always talk with my hands up here. I, I do a lot of hand gestures, but they're usually down here where you can't see them on the camera. I, I'm I'm artificially bringing my hands up here. This isn't this isn't the person I am. Um, you know, being up in the camera like this was it better when I was kind of further back? You know, just just anything like that. If anyone has any feedback on that, I really I feel like I'm starting to get a hang of this, but I ultimately really do not know what I'm doing. Still, this is very new to me. I have not been doing video stuff for long. Um, I am definitely feeling like I need to get some extra lights because I'm definitely noticing more and more often that I get little flashes in my glasses and I just I hate that it's so annoying I, maybe nobody else sees it but it absolutely drives me insane so um anyways I'm rambling at this point I should call it um thanks everyone for watching I hope you enjoyed it I had a lot of fun making it and uh, a few weeks from now we'll have the next video out so um I hope everybody will stick around for that one as well